just right here. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out today. Today's author event is co-sponsored by the Portage District Library and the Kalamazoo Area Women's Club. I'm Ann Pancella. I'm a member of the Kalamazoo Area Women's Club. Our club is an affiliate of the historic General Federation of Women's Clubs, which was founded in 1890 to organize the many thousands of women's club that were existing in the United States and even around the world at that time. The GFWC, as we call it, continues today. There are 42 clubs still in the state of Michigan and clubs in all 50 states. And each club works to try to improve their community and the world through volunteer service. Our club and the GFWC recognizes the importance of literacy and the arts and libraries. So we're very pleased to co-sponsor this event today. Uh, we do meet on the third Friday of the month in the afternoon and we welcome new members. Those of us who are wearing these book theme name tags can give you more information. And I think we have some flyers over by the refreshments. And if you didn't see the refreshments, they are uh, in that room when we're done. So I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine, who's gonna introduce our distinguished speaker. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we are delighted to welcome Lindsay McMillan, um, our author, and I just want to tell you a little bit about her before we get started. Lindsay McMillan is an author, TEDx speaker, and former VP at Goldman Sachs. After graduating magna cum laude from Dartmouth College, she worked at Goldman Sachs for six years in both New York and London, rising up to become vice president. While working in finance, she carved out early mornings and weekends to pursue her dream of being a novelist. After signing two book deals, she took the leap to write full time and bring her business background into the arts as an authorpreneur. Her debut novel, The Heart of the Deal, is a contemporary love story published June 2022, and her second book is forthcoming in 2023. Strong, relatable women are redefining success in their careers and relationships are at the center of her stories. She delivered a popular TEDx talk called Love is Not a Business Deal, drawing on her experiences as a Wall Street investor and author. She now lives in her hometown of Kalamazoo, Michigan. So I love the book, The Heart of the Deal. I hope you will too. If you don't have your copy, feel free to grab one from This is a Bookstore, Book Bug. They're here today, and they are also a wonderful bookstore in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you to Anne and the Women's Club for sponsoring this event. I have to say, hometown events are really hold such a special place in my heart over the past few months that I've gotten to kind of go out in the world and go on a book tour from New York to California. There's nothing quite like coming home and sharing it with, um, you know, literally the library that I went to as a kid. And I would go, I was telling Catherine, I we would always come on the first day of summer vacation. I went to Madawan schools, but we had a Portage library card because I guess we were a Texas township. Um, and, you know, just picking out those lists for summer readings and getting all of that inspiration that was fueling these creative dreams from even a young age. So I'll talk a little bit today about my story, my path to becoming an author, expanding a bit on, um, on Catherine's nice intro there, and then highlight a few themes from the book, whether you've read it or not, it doesn't matter. We can just kind of dive in a little bit and then, you know, answer any questions and open it up to conversation. So, you know, when I say that this is a, a life dream of mine, I'm 28 now and, you know, when I was in first grade as a six-year-old, I wrote down on a big poster board, we were given, you know, that poster that said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I wrote, I want to be an author. And also in first grade, I wrote my first short story um, and I asked, I was kind of a shy kid, but I asked if I could read it to the class and I read it to the class at our Halloween party and it just instilled some kind of, I don't know, magic of having this creative imagination tool within me and being able to write stories and then share that with other people. So that was, you know, I think I've always been interested in a lot of different things in life. So it wasn't like I just had tunnel vision on writing, but it was a big part of 
of who I kind of became as I was growing up. I was always jotting down stories and poems. And um, then when I was 18, I actually wrote my first full-length manuscript. This is my first book, but I should say it's my fifth book. So this is the first one that got published. There's a joke in, in fiction writing that you have to write a thousand pages of nonsense, basically, until you can write one good page of fiction. Um, so I definitely went through that process. But for me, um, I think there's a central theme, probably in many of our lives, of taking painful experiences and then using them as catalysts for art and beauty and all of that. So my parents were getting divorced when I was a senior in high school. And the summer before I went to college, you know, I just poured into the page. And I wrote this fictional book about this young woman who um, her parents were getting divorced. She was falling in love for the first time. She was moving away from home. So kind of these themes that were adjacent to my own life. But I realized the power of fiction to be able to be free of what actually is happening, to be free of living in your own head and all of the facts there and taking your experiences and then just transforming them and finding that liberation through absorbing, you know, through creating characters and really befriending characters and having them keep you company. That was always um, a really beautiful thing that I found with, um, with my writing. So. I then went to Dartmouth College. I was the first um, person from Matawan High School to go to Dartmouth. I was a bit intimidated by the Ivy League scene and the prep school kids and all of that. But I'm proud to say my Michigan public school uh, education served me very well. And I was able to hold my own. I went kind of the economics track because that it was a liberal arts school. That was kind of the business, the business track. My parents were in business. I figured I'm not going to have them spend all this money and then come out only with a creative writing English degree. I want to be employable. So that was kind of the practical side of me. And I was interested in it. But really, my love was the creative writing. And I took my first workshop class when I was a freshman. And I just thought it was the coolest thing that I could get course credit for making up stories and workshopping the chapters of the book that I had written um, before coming to college. And then I wrote two more. Uh, manuscripts and got you know wonderful instruction as I was at Dartmouth and I really learned a lot about the craft of it and how to arc the narrative, the pacing, the character development, um, really that deep dive into prose. Uh, what I didn't feel like I you know came away too much with, I think there's just a big gap in in general is actually how do you get published? So it's great to hone your craft and become a a great writer, but that's not enough if you, you know, want to get published. There's a whole other side that is really the business side of publishing, as I call it now, um, of understanding how do you actually get a literary agent? How do you pitch your book? How do you, you know, articulate how it's differentiated from competitors in the market, but also similar to competitors in some ways so that they know there's a market for it and it will sell. And I really kind of just undertook the process of educating myself on, you know, if I want to see my book in Barnes and Noble, if I want to see my book in Portage Public Library, how do I uh, go about that? So I sent myself with my babysitting money, um, I guess this would have been sophomore or junior year of college, to my first publishing conference in New York. Uh, took the bus down, first time in New York, um, and it was really, really inspiring. Like, I think I was the youngest person at the conference, um, but the gentleman who led it, we were able to pitch to agents, pitch to editors. I didn't get anything out of that, but he really took me out of my, under my wing, and he saw something in me. And he was actually the one who interviewed me in New York just a couple of months ago for my New York book launch, and um, has been there through one of the encouraging voices saying, yes, Lindsay, it will happen. In addition to my mom, who I should say, this book is dedicated to her. She, um, she's a professor at Kalamazoo College. She's teaching during this time, but she has been my biggest supporter and fan because there were many years when I was you know, not just writing, but really revising my manuscripts, pitching them, trying to get a literary agent because the agent kind of serves as the gatekeeper between the author and the publisher for the big publishers. It's pretty old fashioned that way. Um, and then 
you know, I, I started a career on Wall Street, which you might say that's totally different to being an author. If you really wanted to be an author, why did you go to Wall Street? But um, like I said, I've always think I've done best when I have both of the sides of the brain going. And I felt like I had this opportunity open to me from Dartmouth that I wanted to get a career foundation, a business foundation, and believe that that was going to serve me well. Um, I'd be lying to say if, that it was easy to balance both. My first year, I really didn't write. My, my writing took a back seat as I was just trying to kind of stay afloat at Goldman Sachs and kind of the stereotypical uh, junior investment banking experience where you're working really long hours, always on the clock, always on call. But for me, the biggest thing wasn't even the hours and, and stuff. It was feeling disconnected from my soul and from feeling like these gifts, like I feel like I've been gifted uh, an ability to write, an ability to be in touch with emotions. And I was kind of having to squash a lot of that to fit into maybe the person that would succeed at Goldman. Um, I was able to pivot after a couple of years and go into their marketing and branding division. So I was incorporating more of my storytelling skills. I was working on uh, thought leadership podcasts and videos and newsletters, kind of, um, summarizing Goldman Sachs experts' views on the economy or the stock market or the industry outlooks. Um, and so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't writing novels, but it gave me time to write novels on the side as well because I had a more predictable schedule. So, um, you know, I called it a bit of my, my double life where I was in the Starbucks at 6 a.m. in the morning working for three hours for myself on my manuscripts. I started this book um, I guess when I was 25, so it took about a year to a year and a half to, to write. Um, and so I would work for three hours, then I would go to work. And then at night, another pushback I had heard, you know, was that I didn't have a digital platform or digital presence, and publishers really demand that these days so that they know that you have an audience to sell the book to. So I was trying to build up an Instagram following on, and I started posting poetry on there and was able to build up um, you know, somewhat of a following there. So I was really firing from all cylinders, trying to just keep at it. Um, and I got my big break in the form of signing with an agent in, in the pandemic in 2020. Um, soon after we landed, soon after I say, but there were still more rejections and revisions in that process, which I think is important to articulate just because I don't want people thinking, um, and especially aspiring authors in the audience too, anyone who, um, it's easy to just say, look back and say, oh yes, you know, it happened at A, B, C in order, but it certainly wasn't linear. Um, this book has gone <laughs> under so many different drafts and forms, um, but I did then land a publisher and was able to get this book out into the world um, in June of this year. And I was able to you know, take that leap and step off the corporate track, um, at least for now. But I really feel grateful for my time at Goldman Sachs, at Wall Street, getting to work in New York and London, and really more than that, take the network, the skills with me. Because um, I think for many years, I kind of saw these as two competing sides of myself, of, there's the creative writer Lindsay, and then there's business Lindsay. And then I realized, you know, it's actually, they're so much more intertwined, or they can be if I allow them to be, because a lot of authors don't have the benefit or the gift of this business background and experience, and they might not feel equipped with their, you know, financial knowledge or marketing, or we've had these amazing women owned um, companies sponsor my book launch in New York because I was able to pitch them similar to how bankers pitch for deals, but I was you know, applying that to my writing. So all to say that has been, yeah, I guess, t a 10 year journey to kind of seeing my first book through. My second one is coming out next year. Um, it's not a sequel to this. It is set in London. It's kind of inspired by um, a season of my life in London. I love having the places be very real and rooted in places that I've lived. So, New York is on the cover of The Heart of the Deal. It's a big, it's a big place in it. Um, and then the people and the characters in the book themselves are more, you know, fiction or a more, they're, they're not, um, you know, it's definitely not memoir, but it is inspired by seasons that I have lived. Um, so with The Heart of the Deal, you know, this is, 
The original title was The Volatile Love Market, <laughs> and it was all about the volatility of relationships in your 20s in New York, kind of. And even on the cover now, there's this stock market graph because the young woman does work on Wall Street. Um, another benefit to my time in there was, I think, kind of getting this experience of being able to create a character who there aren't that many you know, women in finance or women on Wall Street in fiction books and you know, modern love stories. Some publishers didn't like it because of that, because they thought it might be too niche. But the bigger thing is, if you've ever had a corporate job, if you've ever had any kind of job, the pressures that this young woman feels are hopefully relatable far beyond that industry. And she's really, you know, this woman, Ray, she is 25 at the bottom of the corporate ladder on Wall Street, you know, feeling like she is behind when it comes to ro romantic relationships or work, um, trying to keep it all afloat and really leaning on her female friendships to keep smiling through it all. Um, so although in a way it's kind of branded as a rom-com or a romance book, it's, it's not. It's a, I call it a modern love story, but it's really exploring love in all of its forms. It's exploring most of all self-love and learning to fall in love with your own path, free yourself of other people's expectations, um, get that confidence that, you know, at any age, I personally have felt it in, in your 20s where you're all kind of spit out into the world looking around thinking, Is, what am I supposed to be doing? They're, they're doing that over there. Am I, you know, um, you know what's, what's authentic to me? And then there's also the real theme of platonic love and friendships and leaning on, um, you know, in the years when, you know, maybe you don't have a partner or people aren't married, um, the, just the importance of your friends in any life stage, but particularly in those years to really keep you grounded and um, enjoying the whole <laughs> ups and downs of the process. And then there's also the love story with New York itself and with the place. And New York is depicted as this fairly tempestuous, passionate partner with all the ups and downs, quite literally visually depicted with the skyline of the ups and downs, but it's really metaphorical for that love-hate type of relationship. Um, and then the characters that Ray, and the male characters that Ray falls for in New York, um, you know, have, have similarities that are kind of, the metaphor expands into the, into the people as well. Um, and, and yes, there is the element of uh, romantic love and figuring out really what characteristics you're valuing in a partner and um, how you also set boundaries and support someone with mental health challenges. So people might look at this book and people have looked at this book and said, oh, it's a cute pink book. Why are you talking about depression and mental health? Because one of the love interests um, whom Ray dates does battle depression. And that is a that is a theme throughout the book, that is a challenge that is expressed. Um, but the book is not holistically about mental health and about depression. For me, it was important just to depict real characters, even though they're fictional, but the prevalence of mental health um, and the impact on relationships just isn't really talked about that much. It's starting to be more, but explored in modern um, fiction. Generally, it's kind of like it's a book about mental health or it's not touched at all. And so I wanted to weave in characters who battle those challenges and explore the messiness, explore the honesty that there is no solution. And that's kind of what Ray comes to realize, not a spoiler, but her journey to accepting people as they are, supporting them as they are, um, but also not losing herself in that process. And so that's why I say overall, it really is, I think, about Ray learning to love herself and her own path and gain that confidence to chart her own, um, her own trail in the world and step off, quote, the conventional track. So those are, you know, some themes from, from the book. I guess the only other one I would touch on is the beauty of um, finding poetry anywhere you are. And Ray wants to be a poet, but she is stuck in this Wall Street job. And she feels really dead creatively and really not synced in, not um, like she's, you know, not tapped into that side of herself. And one of the good things from her relationship with Dustin and her friendships is that it starts to unlock her creativity. And I see her, the relationships really just holding up a mirror to herself, um, helping herself see 
helping her see herself and parts of herself more clearly. Um, and she and Dustin start playing this game that they call poem spotting. And they just go on their day off from work and they go to Brooklyn cafes and they jot in a little, um, in a little notebook that he calls the Stall Street Journal because it was a little gift that he gave her to write little poems in the bathroom stall, which was her only refuge from the guys at work. She would kind of take her coffee breaks, essentially, in the bathroom. Um, and they just look around them at these everyday things. So it could be the way the light is shining on the window, the scarf that's dragging on the ground, and they would create little poems, just one line about it, and just learning to see the world through that artistic lens. And it's so easy, particularly you know, in a place like New York and Wall Street where it's the rat race and you're just on, on, on. But in any of our lives, it's really easy just to kind of focus on the logistics and going from point A to point B without observing these little hidden moments of poetry throughout. So in a way, I almost thought, think of this whole book as a sneaky poem that is um, hopefully encouraging people to open their hearts and um, you know, get to know the characters and then get to know their own story a little bit better from all of that. So that's kind of an overview of my journey to it, the, the book itself. Um, and yeah, I would love to you know, answer any questions or go deeper into, into certain areas. Anne? Okay. I have a question about your um, process. Once you found a publisher, uh, did they change your manuscript much? Or did you at any point feel you lost control of it? That's a really good question. Um, no, I did not feel like I lost control of it, but there were moments where, for example, um, even at the agent stage, I had a bigger agency, an agent from a bigger agency, who um, really saw the book, liked the book, wanted to take me on, but really wanted to pivot it in a very different direction, versus the agent I went with, Abby, she's been wonderful. She. Um, I, I never want people telling me that they don't see revisions or ways that can get better, because it can always. But I really felt like her points were going to help the book become stronger and not just kind of cater to serve what's marketable. Or my biggest tension, I think, has been, and where, when I don't write as well, it's like if I'm just trying to write to please somebody else. And it feels like a lot of the publishing industry is very, um, it's a, it's a business in its own, right? It's just as corporate as Wall Street, candidly. Um, so I think I've been focused on, yeah, retaining, always trying to get better, trying to, yes, if I need a snappier hook, like that's where the heart of the deal hook, we had to kind of revise that um, and have this deal where she wants to lock in a husband by her 30th birthday. That was not in the original ones. That was kind of like a one-liner that they could use. I ended up feeling like it was authentic to the book, and I was able to do that in a way that really honored the characters, but there were some that I just felt like um, from both on the agent side and feedback from publishers, that was really going to skew it in a direction that I wasn't uh, as comfortable with. So I think the good thing was at each juncture, I was able to have multiple offers from agents and then multiple offers from publishers to go with the one that was most aligned, because I can't say if, if it had been my only path to getting published, I, you know, I hope I wouldn't quote sell out, but it's also so many years in the, so many years of trying to do it that there is an element of practicality of just saying, okay, maybe I have to give them what they want, and then get more credibility and start to go in more in my own direction. But with this book, I really felt like I was able to retain that. Um, and my editor didn't really pub. They don't really. She had very minor uh, revisions, so I did more revisions at the agent stage because the agent takes an editorial role in terms of providing that feedback. Um, my publisher, the, my editor, really didn't have much, um, just little things. Yeah, good question. So how did you learn to write? <laughs> how, do you, how does one do that? I mean, I think that we are all writers. And I think that just that initial stage of getting things on the page, for me, it, came, it just came really naturally. The, what I, I don't mean getting it perfect came naturally, because a lot of my first drafts are horrible. But the idea of needing to get it out of me onto the page has been 
instinctive for me. I do think some people that is just kind of how they are wired and how they express themselves. So for me, um, getting that first draft down and getting it, even if it's bad, even if it's messy, um, I feel invested in it. And then I have kind of this commitment to going back and revising it. Because I think how you get to be a good writer is not writing, it's revising. Um, so I, I don't think any author would say that you know their first draft is some great work of art. Um, it may be, for me, I like to feel like I'm invested in the characters. I'm, there's something pulling me into it. But just the, I mean, it's mostly discipline and dedication just to slowly then building up in the second draft um, based on, yes, what I've learned in writing workshops. Like, I find writing workshops where pe you kind of sit around a table and there are 10 people around it or so. You all read each other's work. You say what you think is working. You say what you think isn't. The professor will give you feedback. Um, and then reading, obviously, a lot of things in that genre and a lot of kind of how-to writing books, like knowing the rules before you can break them. But it is a very slow process of then building up each chapter and each scene. And I think that's what sometimes gets a, a, a misperception where you think, oh, I'm you know, living my dream. I'm following my passion. Every day is this passionate. I just write, uh, write really well and it's in flow and all of that. Most of it is you know, really not that glamorous at all. It is much more just taking, in my case, when I was balancing it at work, you know, could I do, could I revise three pages a day and make those three pages good? Um, and just build, build, build that up and then go basically do it all again for four or five more drafts before the end. Um, and so I think it's, but also I felt like for me, the only way I learned how to write a book was by writing a book and then doing it again. Even um, as much instruction as you can get, it just can't, like for me, my early books, I look back and the pacing, I would spend way too long on certain sections and then way too little on the next and the time didn't flow very well. And that's something where as a reader, hopefully you don't even almost think about that because you feel like it's just flowing. But from an author standpoint, it's very difficult to achieve that balance um, and advance the plot while advancing the characters and their growth. So for me, it's been kind of yeah, the combination of just trial and error, plus all of the more formal workshop setting stuff, and just carving out and kind of like holding sacred this time of day that even if I only actually get a paragraph edited, or even if I, if maybe I'll get you know 10 pages that day, but um, committing to it because it is a, it's not something that just happens. <laughs> Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Did you have an endpoint in mind when you went into this book, or did you just kind of let it take you where it was going to take you? That's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, so did I have an endpoint in mind, or did I let the book take me? And I've tried it both ways because. In the beginning, when I was getting pushback from publishers, and they said, oh, you don't have a strong enough hook. It's not you know, the plot. They put such a premium on plot and what happens versus I've always thought good writing and good characters you know, speak for itself, and it can kind of go where it wants to go. Um, so there were times when I actually would try more to outline the book, and I would have more, here's what's going to happen, um, and try to write to that. It has never felt organic to me. It has never felt real, so I've always end up, ended up throwing those away and essentially starting back from, from ground zero. So for this one, I really, I didn't plan um, the first draft, but, the, but if you read the first draft or looked at it, um, it's entirely unrecognizable to this. So I kind of use the first draft as the exploration. I roughly say that my books have three main stages of the drafts. The first is exploration and you just really let the book go you let it be bad you let the characters meander and you just try to you know figure out the heart of the story um, the second stage is the um, execution of it so that's where you're really building it up 
And then the third stage is the elevation where you get to play around with word choice and you get to drop little hints from chapter two that you pick up on in chapter 21 um, and all of those things that kind of just polish it. But you know, there's no one, way, one right way or wrong way for it, but for me, it has always just felt um, more truthful to my characters. Maybe that sounds like a weird thing to say, but I've never felt like I can tell them what to do. <laughs> they have to tell me what they want to do. Um, there were scenes where I was writing this book. Again, I worked on it largely in the Starbucks across from Goldman Sachs, which is not exactly a touchy-feely place. And I would be crying in a corner and my coworkers would come in because it would be you know, before work and maybe they're picking up their coffees to go into the office. They're like, Lindsay, are you okay? And um, I'd say, my characters are, are breaking up and I don't want them to break up. I didn't want them to or something. Um, and there is this moment of that spontaneity of them sort of speaking to me. Uh, so I think you know, whether there's a rough outline or whether there's not, giving that space to let it evolve. And I think that's why multiple drafts is so important because it takes the pressure off of it needing to be um, all thought out beforehand. Yeah, so I'm candidly figuring out my new schedule fairly real time because I had one schedule when I was working my day job and then doing this on the side. In a way, it almost, you know, it forces discipline when I knew that I was going to be working, um, you know, whatever from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. for Goldman, I had to structure my writing around that. So for me, I'm generally a morning person and I knew that that was the time of day I could protect for myself because I didn't know necessarily how long I would be working or if I'd have to do something after work. Um, so I carved out mornings and I really kept that with me as my kind of sacred time for the new books that I'm working on. Um, and I don't know, it's like if you feel off if you maybe haven't gone on your walk or worked out or um, you know, eaten well. I kind of feel off if I don't get my good right in. Like everyone around me can kind of tell I'm just a bit more irritable. Um, having said that, I'm continually learning the value of having a day or two a week where I unplug completely and I actually give myself that rest because I think I put, you know, I put a lot of pressure on myself, particularly now that it's my full time job, that I don't really feel like. I deserve um, a day off or that I need to be, you know, constantly churning out more because I have more time. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I try to take Sundays off completely um, and then I work in the mornings now for about three hours in the morning for new material and then I do a lot of my business side of things, so whether that be setting up events, brand partnerships, um, you know, working on pitching a new book, things like that. Um, that's more of the, the other side of the brain kind of in the afternoon. And then maybe I'll edit some pages that I wrote in the morning in the evening. So generally the morning is kind of that one devoted time. And I'm trying to let myself sleep a lot more now, rest more, and I'm kind of understanding I don't actually have to be three times more productive just because I don't have my Goldman job. I'm you know, able to have a more balanced life and there's a lot of beautiful things about that. So, oh, and as far as where I write, the coffee shops, yes. So New York coffee shops. Um, I loved going around Brooklyn, around all the different um, boroughs really when I was writing this book on the weekend that would inspire me a lot. And similarly, my next book, which is set in London, um, I lived there for a year and just moved back in March. Um, I wrote in all these different tea shops and tea houses around the UK. Um, and it was this beautiful way to see a place and also be inspired. So I'm kind of figuring out, I'm, I'm back with my mom now in this area and we live out, kind of out in the woods on a little lake. Uh, so I get inspired by nature, but I also miss kind of that city energy. Um, so I'm tr still kind of exploring coffee shops around here. If you know any then that are, I was just at um, 
Water Street before this. So there are, there are some nice places, but I really like, um, yeah, just exploring new places through where I write and picking up little bits of that that kind of work their way into the books themselves. So I came back here um, for what I thought was two weeks to stay with my mom, and I ended up staying through that summer of 2020. Then I went back to New York. Then I came back here. I was kind of back and forth. Um, I was a bit worried because I was also trying to network a lot in New York with you know, New York being the center of the publishing um, world, or at least for the country. Uh, you know, I would go to events on the weekends, I would go to book launches, I would try to meet agents, and there wasn't that element, so I was a bit nervous, um, but I ended up just getting my agent through, you know, queer querying through emails, and we Zoomed, and, you know, I've still never met her. Actually, yeah, she came to my book bug event in, um, in June, but I didn't actually find that the pandemic held me back. If anything, I was able to not be in the office, so I was able to be more efficient with my work because uh, Wall Street, at least my experience with it, was it's, it's not a place where if you get your work done early, you can go home, <laughs> at least when I was junior and trying to rise the ranks. Um, they just look, they want you to be in your seat, and it's a very FaceTime culture, as they say. So when I was working from home, I was able to do the same amount of work, but w have a few extra hours, so I would use those hours to either um, get time outside, which I really enjoy, or, you know, spend my lunch hour writing or something and not having someone breathe over my shoulder. So in a way that was, um, you know, actually helpful to the writing, but I think if my book had launched in the height, height of the pandemic, it would have been a real shame, especially for first-time authors like myself, trying to break in, trying to connect with readers. I love meeting people face-to-face. Zoom just doesn't have that same charm and magic. And so for those in-person events, I've been super grateful that you know, pretty much all of those have been able to go off. So. Can you read us a little something and give us a sample of the characters? Yeah. Um, well, do you want the, from the beginning or deeper in? What would you like to do? I'll start from the beginning. I think it sets her up pretty well. So the first chapter, Quarter Life Crisis. I'll just read the first page or so, just give you a flavor. Returning from a long Sunday in the office, Ray paused at the top of the stairs to catch her breath. She didn't want to show up out of breath to her own birthday party, particularly her quarter century birthday party. Dabbing, the, dabbing her face with the sleeve of her suit jacket to mop up the sheen, she let herself into her apartment, the Perry Street penthouse as she and her roommate Ellen had rebranded their top, top floor walk up. Happy birthday, Ellen shrieked from the kitchenette. She was slicing blocks of cheese with a plastic knife. I'm 25, not 85, Ray said. No need to shout. But she was smiling. Where's everyone else? Everyone else, being the two friends from college she'd managed to hang on to through the real world craze of the past few years. The scramblets, the foursome called themselves, after their joint culinary invention, a half omelet, half scrambled egg creation, accidentally born from subpar flipping abilities. The spelling was inspired by the Rockettes to give it some New York flair. Sarah's just texting that she's getting on the subway, Ellen said, and you know how Mina is. Ray grunted. She'd hoped that mid-twenties would be more punctual than early twenties, but apparently the scramblets were still the scramblets. Why aren't you wearing your robe? They had agreed on a bathrobe theme, much more sophisticated than a pajama th party, Ray thought, much more adultish. It's over there, Ellen said, pointing to the undersized couch where an oversized robe was draped over the armrest. Snitched it from the hotel during my business trip. Very savvy, Ray said, retrieving her own robe from her bedroom. The term bedroom was generous. To afford West Village rent, they'd inserted a drywall to split the one bedroom into two. The wall stopped a, a foot short of the ceiling to comply with fire regulations. Ray removed the bathrobe from one of the plastic hooks that held up most of her belongings, the ones that hadn't already fallen to the floor. The landlord didn't allow nails, and her closet didn't fit anything beyond her black work pants and white collared shirts. 
in an attempt to mitigate the sexism rampant in investment banking, she dressed identically to the men. She thought the strategy might be working, though perhaps that was only because modern sexism was often too subtle for anyone, including her, to notice. Online, the bathroom had looked a confident white, but it had turned out to be more of an indecisive eggshell. Still, better than the polka dot one she'd been tempted by. Polka dots were early 20s, not mid 20s, not to mention that robe had been $4 more expensive. So that's just a little tidbit into her 20s life of you know, slicing cheese with a plastic knife and you know, not having a real bedroom that feels like home and kind of these experiences. It was interesting when I was, um, one of the pieces of feedback back to your question, Anne, I think it was, of kind of what the publisher editors want to change. My publisher, being a New Yorker, she's like, you know, 25 is such a baby age. No one would even be thinking about getting married. No one would be thinking about um, these things. Like, let's make her in her, let's make her 30 when she starts rather than 25, something like that. And, and I pushed back on it because there are so many of these details where hopefully by 30, there's a little bit more that you have. Um, you're still figuring things out, but a lot of these details are pretty juvenile with kind of Ray and her friends just making it on the bare minimum, drinking wine out of, you know, chipped coffee mugs and all of these, you know, little details. So um, I was kind of grateful to be able to capture that life stage and, and also, yeah, understand kind of how the difference is in what 25 means in New York versus in what 25 means in Michigan. There, there are some of those. Um, so that sets the scene a little bit. I was wondering what you did with those, um, how ever many you wrote before this. <laughs> Are they published? Do you keep them? Do you think they'll ever be used in another series? I keep them. Right now I haven't had a tug to go back and really revise to publish them. Because I'm really, I, I believe in the value that they have played to lead me. I know I wouldn't have been able to write this book without them. So I see the stepping stones and I see how they were part of the process. So I kind of go to my first one. I guess I went to the FedEx on West Nidge or Kinko's at the time, I guess, maybe something. And um, just asked them to print it out. I brought my floppy disk <laughs> back in the day, and I, you know, had printed out the 450-page manuscript, and I kept it. Um, and I've done that for other ones. Like I, I had kind of gotten to a point where I wasn't sure if I would, you know, it's so difficult to break in and get published. It's difficult to get into Dartmouth, difficult to get into Wall Street, but a hundred times more difficult to get published. Um, and I kind of had gotten to a point where I was like, even if all I have are this, is this box of printed out manuscripts, I believe in this art. I believe that this is part of um, you know, my purpose in the world. And if, even if I only pass it down to my kids someday, then that would be worthwhile. And I think that that was a reason I'm grateful it did take me, you know, I didn't get it on my first try, is kind of that helping detach the ego part of the dream versus you know, the why, the deeper sole reason that you're doing it. Um, and of course, I still battle that. But it, it was kind of, yeah, this understanding that even if all I have is this box of books that have never been published that are under my bed, that's, that is valuable. Um, and I could see myself going back to one or two of them. But right now, I just have so many other ideas. <laughs> so I'm kind of, yeah, I'm inspired by where I am. Maybe if I hit a period of writer's block. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's interesting because I didn't think it was anything controversial or you know, new necessarily to have a woman in a male-dominated um, industry be a lead character. But for, quote, a modern love story, um, modern romance book, yeah, most of the characters are they 
work in advertising or they're um, artists or influencers or things like that. And I guess I didn't necessarily expect the response from women on, on Wall Street and women in corporate America to feel so seen. Like it's the coolest thing to have people from, and not just the finance industry, but kind of across the board of um, any kind of job where you're feeling like you're trying to establish yourself um, and go up the next rung, but your heart isn't in it. And the, the coolest thing probably has been, I mean, receiving notes from people, men and women, I should say, because I don't like the label women's fiction, because I think men can enjoy it too. And women, it's just assumed that we enjoy books written by men with male characters. So the same should be true on the other side. Um, but it is really cool to hear from people around the world writing in and saying, you know, it has given them courage to leave their co corporate job and pursue a creative dream or at least carve out time for their creative passion um, or, you know, that they didn't necessarily hear people talking about the pressures of balancing the personal and professional um, in, the, in this way through a fictional story. Like there's a lot of like women how-to businesses and Sheryl Sandberg actually supported this one, which was amazing. Um, but obviously there's kind of like the lean in uh, corporate books for women, but we don't really see ourselves reflected in fiction in the same way. Um, and so it's been really beautiful to hear how people are still having this escapism experience, which I think is the beauty of fiction, um, but also feeling empowered or seen through it. that wasn't severe, that was real and trying to live in the world. Yeah, um, so Dustin, whom Ray dates and has this on and off relationship with, um, battles depression. And, um, you know, I think uh, from a combination of, I guess, personal experiences, I actually lost a friend to suicide that I left that part out of the story, but that was one of the things that catalyzed my move from the investment banking side of things to the brand and marketing side. She was a Dartmouth friend also working on Wall Street, working into the, um, yeah, basically worked to the ground. And that was just one of those life experiences where you feel so shaken and you pick your head up and say, you know, what do I want to do in the world and be in the world? Um, and, you know, I think that particularly experience put on my heart having me more open discussions about mental illness and depression and also kind of, yeah, having dated people who battle depression um, and seeing just the prevalence of it in uh, modern society but not really feeling like the characters in fiction are necessarily holistically rounded in that. But like you said, it's, Dustin's depression isn't the most severe end. There's not a suicide attempt. There's not that type of thing, uh, which was actually the moderation with which it was explored was a point of controversy from publishers because they kind of thought I should make it really extreme or leave it out altogether. So I'm really grateful and proud that I was able to include it where you're able to see someone who is aware that he is battling depression. He is aware that he is not emotionally available. Um, there's actually one of my favorite lines from the book is when Ray is just learning about his depression. He kind of went cold turkey on her um, and she you know, feels rejected, but then she realized, wait a second, there's something more. He didn't just ghost me. There's something more going on here. He opens up to her that he's been you know, battling depression and um, doesn't feel like he's in a spot where he can be a, a great partner to her. And he said, you know, she's saying she still really wants to be there for him, at least as a friend. And he says, but promise me you won't steal from your own sunshine to keep my soul out of the shade. And it speaks to, you know, his observation that it was going to take a toll on Ray, whether she was a friend, whether she was more to him. Um, but then you still see elements where he almost just, to an extent, takes advantage of her kindness or is still... She is still trying to pour herself into him so much and fix it. And this messiness that I think is just really the characteristic trait of mental illness um, 
is that it doesn't just impact that person, it spills over into their relationships. Um, and there's not, a, there's not a fix. So it's ultimately this boundary setting, um, you know, Ray being this compassionate uh, character that she is, and also from her more analytical fix it side, kind of approaching it, trying to get him to the other side and believing throughout the book that there is an other side. And then kind of having to realize, wait a second, I either kind of love him and accept him like as he is fully right now, um, or I, I just can't, this isn't you know, healthy for me. And she has different periods throughout the book where she has to take a step back or leave, where she sticks up for herself. Um, but that's a difficult position you know, for her to get to that point. And um, I, I, what I hope to depict is really yeah, what, what, what it's like on both sides. Not that this is any way speaking to everybody's experience. It's not a um, pervasive universal exploration of mental health, but in one specific story, um, people getting a little bit more understanding or empathy or feeling um, validated or related if that's something that they've experienced in their life. Yeah. It's like you cannot change this guy. Completely. I don't think, you know, when she persists, she has to work through that. Completely. Yeah. yeah. That's been age old advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think, like I said, I think these, a lot of these themes are cons can be consistent at different life stages, but I think particularly in her 20s, where there is still a lot of that um, idealism that she has to work through. She knew there was other awareness of this problem and this issue. This had been ongoing. And, and, um, and as a parent, you, you have a sensitivity to that, whatever your child is going through at whatever age, you know. That, that I thought that was a nice element, if I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah, you are. And yeah, Ray's understanding that. Um, you know, the last thing she would want to do is just leave Dustin and have him have no one. So she knew, knew that his parents and his mom particularly um, had been helping him through. But then, you know, understanding, okay, it's also not all on Ray. Like there are other people who care about him and who are going to shoulder some of that because sometimes maybe it's human tendency, we, tendency, we almost want to feel super, really special. Like Ray feels like, oh, he's the, Dustin's the only, he, he, I, he uh, only feels comfortable confiding in me. I'm the only one who sees the real Dustin. Um, without me, you know, he wouldn't have anyone. And there's also, I think the mother's role was important there because it was almost Ray not passing a baton, but share, shoulder, sharing some of that um, knowledge and burden. Not, not, that, not that he was a burden, but um, just sharing that experience of supporting somebody and, and letting herself acknowledge that there were other people who cared about him. We're about out of time for questions. Are there any final questions for Lindsay? Lindsay, would you m honor us by reading um, anything that you consider one of your favorite parts of the book? Because I always find it interesting what, what parts authors uh, love and hold on to after they uh, get a book published. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try to find the um, section that I alluded to that quote about Dustin sharing about his depression. So just a moment. OK, I have it. So this is. Yeah, Dustin has kind of gone dark on Ray after a few dates. She thought it was going well, hasn't heard from him. He reached out to get coffee with her. She's now at coffee. She's expecting him to say, you know, 
just not interested, kind of like let her down easily. Instead, he's opened up that um, he's just not in a good place with his depression and that that's something he's battling. Um, I'm not dragging you into this, he said. It's better if I keep my distance. Ray's body tightened. She moved away from him on the bench. What's wrong, Dustin asked. Don't go, she whispered, just softly enough that if he ignored her, she could almost believe he hadn't heard. Ray, I just need to get myself to a better place. All she heard was, I don't want you. She pulled her hood up over her eyes. The fabric wasn't as soft as the Santa hat, but it blocked the light better. I don't want to hurt you, Dustin said. Too late. She was aware that she was making it all about her, but she couldn't stop the habit and she couldn't stop the hurt. So she just kept sitting there in the January air next to another guy who was about to walk out of her life. They sat in silence until Ray was certain he'd left. He was, she was so convinced she was alone on the bench that she flinched at the sound of his voice. Be my friend, he asked. Ray peeked through her hood. He was still there right beside her. A single tear leaked down her cheek. She had no desire to wipe it away. He was asking her to stay. He wanted her in his life and as a friend. That was even better than a girlfriend, really. You couldn't break up with your friend. She nodded slowly until her hood shrugged off. Good, Dustin said. Friends. The word turned over on his tongue like he was trying it on for fit or maybe flavor. He seemed disappointed in himself that he hadn't arced the conversation toward a tidy ending. But they both saw now, in the fading daylight, that there was never going to be anything tidy about the two of them. The question was whether there had to be an ending. But you have to promise me something, he said. What, Ray sniffled. Don't steal from your own sunshine to keep my soul out of the shade. A half beat passed, then a whole. Ray had a gnawing yet calming sense that she'd look back at this life, at, at this moment, as one of the pivotal emo emotional inflection points of her life. I won't, she said, a hiccup punctuating the poetic promise. And I think why that scene has stuck with me is, um, you know, I think it's easy to put a lot of, it's easy for someone battling mental illness to think that they're going to be a burden on someone else and it's better if they just keep their distance. But similarly, it can feel like a rejection from the other person's perspective if they want to be there or help and support them. And we all bring our own stories and traumas from the past um, into our current relationships. And for me, that was a really poignant part of their initial connection and understanding that they were going to try to let each other in, in whatever capacity they could at the moment. Thank you all. This was right. really wonderful. I appreciate well, it. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Let's give Lindsay a round of applause. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you to those viewing on YouTube. Sadly, you won't be able to take part in our refreshments, but we do have refreshments in the next room. Also, you can get a copy of The Heart of the Deal at This is a Bookstore Book Bug in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And if you want to be involved with the fantastic community of women here in the greater Kalamazoo area, you definitely should um, join the Kalamazoo Area Women's Club. They meet on the third Friday at what time? one to three so if you are looking to um, make some connections and find a community definitely look them up thank you so much and have a wonderful day well thank you again i appreciate